Mr. Harrison. I want to talk to you about the extortion racket you ran with wheelchairs. We're running an extortion. Yeah. We're running an extortion racket. Hey, stop it. You're not trying to smash that Tonight, the private security crooks who sell you a false sense of security and may mug you in the process. As our poorly resourced police retreat from the streets, just who is now on the beat? You can't be a camera, God, bastard. The best person to run a security company is someone that has been on the other side of the fence. We've been aware that the wrong type of people have been employed by certain companies, which has led to people who are in uniforms being trusted when they're not entitled to be trusted. We need the outlaw, the cowboy companies, the criminal element, in order to gain or regain credibility. There are hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds examples of, of examples of crooked security guards. The funeral of Ronnie Cray, one of the biggest and most bizarre security operations of recent years. With resources severely stretched, the police need outside help. Dave Courtney, a London gangster and long-time associate of the Cray family, is delighted to offer his own private security company. The police have little option but to accept. He's the man with the inside knowledge. Well, the old saying, it takes one to know one, I do truthfully believe that someone that's been sort of come up through the ranks, so to speak, is the best person to run a security company. It doesn't necessarily mean that he has to be a villain while he's doing it. Everyone changes, you know. Liverpool this weekend, an armed police response unit prepares to patrol the streets where one man has been shot dead and another five wounded in 11 separate incidents this month alone. As the police concentrate on the battle against large-scale and organized crime, they leave a vacuum on the streets, which is increasingly being filled by an army of private security firms. With no control over who's employed and no regulations in force, it's a business which is making a lot of people very nervous. You're getting people who are coming out of prison who've committed offences and been convicted of very, very serious offences indeed, and what they're doing is setting up companies for their own benefit and using those companies to actually prey on the fear of crime. Security firms continue to proliferate. There are around 40,000 more private security guards than there are policemen in the country as a whole. Around 8,000 private companies employ nearly 170,000 people. What do you really need to set up in the security business? Clearance from the police? Certainly not. Registration with the local authority? Not a bit of it. A criminal record? Well, that doesn't matter a bit. Reference from your bank manager? Reference. You don't even need a bank account. Though a telephone and a uniform might be helpful. So what do you really need to get going in the security business? We're about to find out. The big cities like Liverpool provide opportunities in plenty for the cowboy and rogue operators to set up in competition with legitimate companies. We decide to go into the security business ourselves to prove how easy it is and how dangerous it can be to compete for business. We invent a name and a logo and move some furniture into a rented shop. The ease with which anyone can move into protecting people's property and goods also worries Britain's police officers. There are known criminals in many of these companies. The public have no right to vet them, no independent assurance of honesty or quality of service in these firms, and no comeback when things go wrong. It's one thing for a burglar to steal your telly. It's quite another to pay him to do it. A man who well understands these concerns is ex-criminal Vinnie Pollard. I've been on what we call both sides of the fence. Um, I've turned from you call it poacher to gamekeeper. Uh, I've had my little ups and downs, I've had my dealings with the police. Vinny, a former professional burglar and thief, set up his security company in Manchester three years ago. 
Tonight, he and his team foil an attempted break-in at a luxury home he's employed to protect. Bugs it out anyway. Okay. <laughs> Vinny reckons his background now enables him to advise people on how best to beat the burglars. If I see a property, I can spot the weaknesses before the householder can. I can tell them what is right, what is wrong. Dave Courtney's millionaire lifestyle bears witness to his place in London's underworld. He's figured prominently in East End gangs, but says security is now one of his legitimate businesses but he makes no secret of his violent past. Oh, it was an actual incident that happened. Uh, that's the one I went to prison for. It. I did do it, yes, I, I have to admit. It has been documented. I have chased a few people with an axe, yeah. And I've caught a few as well, I might add. We might catch the media's eye because it's London when, when a certain incident happens. But the truth of the matter is, the more up north you get, the more violent uh, it is. I mean, it's, it's more like the gunfight the OK Corral up there than it is, you know, down here. Back in Liverpool, and our business is about to take off, so we prepare to recruit potential guards. Applicants are asked if they have a police record. All but one say they haven't. One of the early applicants, Joseph Kent, appears to be a good prospect for a job. His application form clearly states he has no criminal convictions, and he repeats this at his interview. Right, no, no criminal convictions. No. Right. 18 years experience, what, in the security business? Yeah. Right. We're recruiting staff because we're offering to provide a security patrol to this estate of 80 houses, initially on a month's free trial. Similar businesses are mushrooming around the country as the local bobby on the beat becomes a distant memory. In Plymouth, local residents and shopkeepers worried about theft and other crimes hired this private security company. Estate security was set up two years ago and at first was warmly welcomed. The rising crime wave has caused grave concern for the residents of Hartley, so much so that they're paying for their homes to be protected by a private security force. In an ideal world, you shouldn't have to be paying because we're already paying in our taxes for the police. Um, but having said that, the police are very stretched, as we all know, and um, they're just not coping with the amount of crime that there is at the moment. The man behind the state security is Mike Stanton, an undischarged bankrupt, owing over a quarter of a million pounds, and with a conviction for serious assault. It's, um, As a bankrupt, he can't be a director of the firm, so he claims to be an employee. His business methods led to the resignation of his operations manager, Mike Jones. The way they actually ran the company as a whole, knocking on doors, getting people to sign up, and one thing they were saying, if you don't sign up, it's not going to work for the whole street and one thing or another. It was basically forceful tactics. Um, they also employ ex-criminals of the like. Um, this is why I myself resigned as the operations manager because I really didn't like the way that the company was going. I mean, basically, that's uh, that really does sum the whole company up, one big con. I think the public is being conned in many cases, because the people operating the companies very often are criminals themselves or former criminals. And they are taking money from people on the pretense that they're going to protect them uh, from other criminals, and yet they could be putting those people at risk themselves. His former partner, Lawrence Enticott, claims that when he left the company, his personal belongings were damaged and he was threatened by Mike Stanton. He'd started to make threats, made uh, death threats towards me over the phone, and had made threats towards other members of staff, um, threatening all sorts um, if they didn't toe the line. When we tried to talk to Mr. Stanton, he went to ground. 
one of the directors of the company was equally shy in front of the camera. Well, I'm not, not prepared to give you my name. I don't think it's really um, material. Well, the company is certainly not a fit and proper company to be doing what it does, not with Mr. Stanton behind it. Well, that's... Um, at this moment in time, we have been advised by our legal advisers not to make any comment. That is a load of cobblers, because the matter under investigation has absolutely nothing to do with security. Right. We've, we've been otherwise advised. The company is under investigation, and it will be no... No comments will be made until that investigation is cleared. The investigation has nothing to do with your fitness to be a security company right. run by an undischarged bankrupt with a, a record of not paying debts and a record of behaving in a most appalling manner. Well, as I said, that is, that is nothing to do with me whatsoever. Back in Liverpool, and we're still processing those job applications. George Graham looks like another attractive prospect. Again, his application reveals no police record. Indeed, we even have to explain what we mean when we ask if he has form. Do you have any form? Any form? Any convictions? Oh, no. <laughs> no, not just driving, anything in general, like any, any assault, criminal convictions. No. But does the interview tell us enough? One man with plenty of experience of interviewing would-be guards is Sean Timney, who runs a security firm in Newcastle-upon-Tyne. The problems with recruiting and vetting candidates is our lack of access to criminal records. We rely on uh, work history. The whole security industry is discredited at the moment. That's why uh, quality companies need to band together. We need regulation, we need to outlaw the cowboy companies, the criminal element, in order to gain or regain credibility. In Sedgefield in North Yorkshire, the private security guards have no problem with credibility. Go ahead, Mr. Five Zero, over. They're a community force formed by the local council who responded to police cutbacks by giving ex Detective Chief Inspector John Reed £300,000 to fund a new council department. Our role is a crime preventive role, a deterrent role. What we want to do is reduce the fear of crime, make people feel safer. And that's what he believes his force has achieved. Now the Sedgefield experiment is being considered as a model by other councils throughout Britain. We are not a security company. We are a service within the district council. We are a non-profit making service. We are a service like the planning department or the housing department. But our main strength is our accountability. We're accountable to the 90,000 people who live in Sedgefield District. Back in Liverpool, we're still vetting the job applications, trying to sort out the lies from the truth. The police share our concern. We want to see a proper vetting process so that the right type of people are employed by the security industry. We also want to see some form of regulation whereby companies that are set up as security companies have the type of regulation and inspection that they need to make sure that they're giving a just and proper service uh, to the members of, of the public. Uh, I think the public deserve that. Remember Joseph Kent? He said he had no convictions. So did his application. What it should have shown his convictions for assaulting a policeman, grievous bodily harm, burglary and theft. Remember George Graham, the man who didn't even know what form was. Well, this was his form. Burglary, theft and handling stolen property and criminal damage. Time to pay them a visit. Our talk with Joseph Kent is brief. What the question was you asked? Mr Kent, you filled in this application form for us and you said you had no criminal convictions. You think you're a fit person to be working? And George Graham is almost equally non-committal. Prison, Mr. Graham. Do you think you should be working as a security guard? Yeah. You do? Yeah. You've got a long list of convictions. I've done it. They've checked up with me. I've done it. I've been started as a security guard. So what's the problem? You've been in prison? Yeah. Are you a fit person to... 
71 job applications and only one of them admitted to having a criminal record. Many of the rest either developed temporary amnesia or were conveniently economical with the truth. This one, more than 20 convictions including grievous bodily harm and theft. This one, gross indecency. This one, possessing firearms and actual bodily harm. This one, possessing drugs. The list goes on and on. In fact, out of the 71 people we interviewed, 48 had been in trouble with the law. That's two out of three people we interviewed. But only one admitted it, and the rest told bald-faced lies. There are hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds examples of, of examples of crooked security guards. And these crooks have to be rooted out until they devise a system by which reputable security firms are able legally to gain access to the police computer to ensure that the guards they are employing have not come out of jail, have been convicted for murder, uh, armed robbery, rape, arson, and a whole range of crimes that I know at this moment people are working in the security industry with this range of criminal convictions. One such major criminal is running a security company here in Liverpool. And it's ironic that a man with a shocking criminal record and a history of going well beyond the law should now be able to use that law to gag us and prevent us from naming him. But that's what's happened. Nevertheless, during the course of our investigations, we've been able to uncover some of the unscrupulous methods that he and a number of other companies have used to get business and to see off the competition. People who might be regarded in some uh, climbs as heavies will visit, uh, say, let's take, for example, a building site or the like, uh, and offer the services. If those services are, are not taken up, then it will be suggested in a very uh, polite way, but it will be clearly have an inference uh, that it should be, their services should be taken on at a price. We basically started work on a petrol station in Liverpool. We'd, we'd been on there sort of two days. We went on the job on the third day. We were told, you know, as of tomorrow morning, you're off the job. Um, we were told at the time that the, you know, the client had decided that they didn't need it. They didn't need the security. They, they weren't prepared to pay the bill. Um, as it happens, the, you know, the, the sort of following day, we were replaced, you know, with one of the road companies. We were having an, an office building refurbished and the work had been going on for just under two weeks when a representative of this particular firm knocked on the door, um, asked to see the foreman of the building firm because um, he suggested that his services were the ones that we should be using. The builder then wrote to us and in that letter he said that this firm was extremely ruthless, that if we didn't use them then potentially ourselves, the premises and his employees would be in danger and that in this part of Liverpool we should use this firm and so we did. Well you're going to finish up where the, the criminality side of businesses is going to outweigh the legitimate side and the legitimate businesses will be forced out and eventually all your security companies will be linked in some way to criminality. What sort of a state of affairs is that? <laughs> That's what happened after the riots on the Meadowell estate in North Shields four years ago. Then, 200 youths went on the rampage, setting fire to shops and offices in an orgy of violence and vandalism after two joyriders were killed in a police chase. Today, millions of pounds are being spent rebuilding the estate. When work started, so did the problems. The council faced losses of £40,000 a week in theft and vandalism, so they hired a local security firm. The man who founded the firm, William Hunter, had just served three years for manslaughter. He beat to death Robert Walsh, a rugby player from Halifax, out celebrating the birth of his daughter. When he came out of jail, Hunter set up Protector Security and won the Meadowell contract now worth £8,000 a week. Almost at once, the thefts and vandalism which had cost £40,000 a week stopped. On the face of it, a worthwhile saving, but concerns remain. I find it very worrying 
that there should be what seemed to be verging on accusations of a protection racket. And I think that is particularly serious and worrying when it concerns a security firm which ought to be beyond all suspicion. William Hunter has issued a statement saying he no longer has anything to do with Protector and the circumstances surrounding the contract are now being investigated by the police. Curiously, within minutes of our turning up at Protector's offices a few days ago, he appears, spots our cameras and vanishes. The council is highly embarrassed. Well, I feel very angry because quite clearly councils in hiring such firms ought to have the protection of regulation of, such, of, of these firms so that we know that they are totally reliable and squeaky clean. Special events provide lucrative contracts for the security industry and they also provide unscrupulous guards with a perfect cover to make contacts for illegal activities. One of our undercover cameras filmed this security guard at London's Alexandra Palace. One of his jobs is to stop drugs coming in, but when we ask him where we can buy some, he doesn't hesitate. Which is hardly surprising, since the dealer is a colleague and another guard off duty and out of uniform because he's suspended. Yeah, he's coming back. Come on up. Outside, a deal is swiftly concluded, as is this guard's career. Shortly after we filmed him, he's fired. Back in the northeast, and another problem on another council estate. Mr. Harrison, I want to talk to you about the extortion racket you ran with wheelchairs. Don't group your bastard! Don't group your bastard! Come on. This estate was quite literally held to ransom by local petty criminal and self-styled security consultant, Peter Harrison. The building firm Wiltshire's, which had the contract from the council to refurbish this estate, paid him 600 pounds a week, presumably so they could live up to their slogan of building with confidence. And when they tried to replace him with proper security personnel, thugs doused the guard hut with petrol and threatened to set both it and the guard alight. When the area remained unguarded for a day or two, many thousands of pounds worth of equipment were either stolen or vandalized. And within the week, Harrison was back on the payroll. No comment. Not surprisingly, Wiltshire's in the person of their site manager were reluctant to talk. General reaction locally is that people are very unhappy about what Wiltshire's are doing. They're very unhappy about the Harrisons having a uh, a, a position of some status and influence with the building contractor. What they see is a group of people who have um, a, a, a reputation for being hard men, uh, being allowed to promote their, their business activities and their influence and power in the area uh, with the backing of a big business, a very big business, as Wiltshire's is a national building company. We're running an extortion, yeah. We're running an extortion racket. Well, Sadly, we've got to the pitch where a major reconstruction project like this, like the Wiltshire project, funded by the government largely through City Challenge uh, and greatly needed by this community, is actually taken over by a family of villains. Oh, yeah, he. Oh, God. I'll smash that. Oh, yeah. I'll smash that over your head. Off. Oh. Off. Oh. Flash. You're not messing with the mug. You close with your camera. Off. Off. Bastard. The Harrison family, seven brothers and their father, have a long string of convictions between them, ranging from burglary to possession of firearms. Today's contingent included Peter Harrison, his brother Alan, his uncle Peter Somerville, and his father Trevor. Mug. Hey, stop it. Since we took an interest in him, Peter Harrison has relinquished the Wiltshire's contract. But unless the government regulates the industry properly, men like the Harrisons will continue to profit from the fears of others.
Roger Cook returns next Tuesday at half past eight. Next tonight, though, the news across Scotland today, followed by the final part of the Churchills rebuilding Britain and coming to terms with failure in 15 minutes.